This is our reaction rate lecture number four on reaction mechanisms. What do balanced chemical equations give us and what don't they give us? Well, they tell us what reacts and what is formed. They tell us the molar proportions of reactants and products. That comes from the coefficients. And the little letters in parentheses after the reactants and products tell us what state or phase they're in. What you don't get, what's colliding, or in what sequence things are colliding. We're not told how the reaction occurs. We're not told anything about reaction mechanism. For that, you have to do experiments in the lab. Reaction mechanism is the key to controlling chemical processes. And the process by which a reaction occurs is called the reaction mechanism. It describes in detail how bonds break and in what order they break and form. The mechanism describes what the molecules look like during the reaction. And these mechanisms are affected by temperature and the presence of a catalyst. Let's simplify the process. We know reactions take place when molecules or ions collide. Methyl isonitrile rearranges to acetonitrile. This is the reaction. What causes the molecule to rearrange? We have to experiment to see if the reaction is first or second order to see if there is a collision involved with the two, with say, two methyl isonitriles or with something else. Now, consider the reaction of nitric oxide or nitrogen monoxide with ozone in the air. The reaction involves a single collision between two molecules. We call this an elementary process, a single collision. Molecularity is given by the number of molecules that participate in each elementary step. There is a unimolecular, and we find methyl isonitrile does not require a collision. There is bimolecular, for instance, the collision of nitrogen monoxide and ozone. And there's termolecular, and there's no simple examples of that. They case occasionally occur in biochemistry. Balanced chemical equations will typically represent the sum of two or more elementary steps. That's called a multi-step mechanism. So here's an example from environmental chemistry. Nitrogen dioxide reacts with carbon monoxide. This occurs in the exhaust of automobiles and in the air. Here's the reaction. The reaction is now on top. Below 498K, the reaction appears to take place in two elementary steps. First, two nitrogen dioxide molecules collide, transferring an oxygen atom to make NO and NO3, a high energy molecule. Then the NO3 collides with the carbon monoxide and transfers an oxygen to make CO2. Here is a diagram of the multi-step mechanism. As you can see, the nitrogen dioxide molecules collide and make the first transition. And then the nitrogen trioxide collides with the carbon monoxide and you see an oxygen exchange and the production, finally, of the CO2 and NO2 end products. Step 1 and Step 2. The sum of those two is the overall reaction, but it's made of two elementary steps. The species NO3 is called an intermediate, a high energy intermediate. Multi-step processes always involve one or more intermediate compounds. For instance, it's been proposed that the conversion of ozone into oxygen proceeds via two elementary steps. Oxygen, the ozone, uh, which is the three atom oxygen, breaks up into oxygen gas, O2, and an oxygen atom, which is high energy. That oxygen atom collides with another ozone, and that forms two oxygen molecules. 
the molecularity of each step in the mechanism we would describe. We would write the equation for the overall reaction, and we would identify the intermediate. Let's do that. Or you can do that, turn off the recorder while you do that, and the, when, the, when you're ready, come back to the player to see the answer. The first step is obviously unimolecular, the breakup of the ozone. And the second step involves two different species, and therefore it is bimolecular. When you add the first two reactions together, you get this. And since the oxygen atom is on both sides, you can drop them out, and you end up with the familiar balanced chemical equation for ozone degradation. There is an intermediate, the oxygen atom, created and consumed in the mechanism. Every reaction is made up, then, of one or more elementary steps. Rate laws and relative speeds of these steps will determine the overall rate law and the overall rate of reaction. The mechanism of the reaction determines the rate law. Thus, empirical rate laws can confirm our postulated reaction mechanisms. We must always go in to the lab to determine what the reaction mechanism is. If we know that a reaction is an elementary step, we know its rate law, if there is no more than one step. The rate law of any elementary step is based on molecularity. A molec in a unimolecular process, a single molecule just forms the product. Therefore, the rate of a unimolecular process must be first order. The rate depends only on the number, the concentration of reactant molecules. The rate is equal to some rate constant times that concentration. In a biomolecular elementary step, you have two things reacting to form products. And therefore, the rate is equal to the rate constant times the concentration of both. Why? Because the more A, the higher the rate, and the more B, the higher the rate, because you're getting increased collisions. The rate then is first order in A and in B. Now, if A and B are the same thing, of course, you will have a, um, you'll have a two, uh, order of two for the reaction. Here is a useful table showing the rate law based on molecularity. And please remember, termolecular is very, very rare. A bimolecular can either be two things that are the same or two reactants that are different. Now let's look at an example. If the hydrogen bromine gas reaction occurs in a single elementary step, predict the rate law. All right, hydrogen runs into bromine, form HBr. Single step, the rate law depends on the molecularity. If it's a one step, it's a bimolecular. The reaction would involve the collision of a hydrogen with a bromine molecule, and the rate would be some constant times the concentration of both the hydrogen and the bromine. So that's what we would see in the lab. However, for this reaction, empirical determination of the rate law shows something very different from the expected. The rate law is the hydrogen concentration times the bromine to the half power. From this, we deduce that the mechanism is not a simple bimolecular collision. It must involve a more complex series of steps. Let's take a useful paradigm for understanding rate laws, and mechanism. Imagine you're standing by US 281 over at TPC Parkway, and the southbound traffic is light at 8 a.m. on a work day. You know something's not right. You deduce that some accident or construction is slowing the traffic upstream, um, maybe way up the road around Bulverde, the city. That is, there is a slow step in the process that's preventing the usually high traffic flow we see at 8 a.m. going southbound. 
No process proceeds faster than the slowest step. Faster steps either produce a buildup of intermediates or they take away the intermediate products faster. The slow step is the rate determining step. Let's look at this reaction, carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide. Empirically we know that it is a second order in NO2 and zero order in carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide cannot be involved in the slow step. Thus the collision between two NO2 molecules must be the slow step. That's how we came up with the mechanism we showed you a few slides ago. Carbon monoxide then comes along and scarfs up the NO3 intermediate, the high energy intermediate, and that must be a fast step. So step one is the collision of two NO2s. Step two is the collision of the NO3 intermediate with the carbon monoxide, and that's fast. You can do further work, uh, and really biochemistry is a nice place to start, how rate laws are determined for chemical reactions. And I would encourage you to do that as you uh, move, for instance, for extra credit.